Howdy, and welcome to a bonus episode of Wise About Texas, the Texas History Podcast. I'm Ken Wise, your host. Thanks for tuning in to this special Juneteenth bonus with Sam Collins III. On the main Juneteenth episode, episode 102, I interviewed Ed Cottom, author of the book Juneteenth and how the um, holiday came about. We talked a lot about Galveston, and we talked about a mural down in Galveston called Absolute Equality that was dedicated on Juneteenth 2021. Well, uh, the work behind that mural was all started by Sam Collins. Sam is a Galveston native, and he is uh, a financial services guy. He's been so for over 20 years. He's a fellow Aggie of mine, and he serves on several boards. He's a trustee of the Rosenberg Library. He's on the National Trust for Historic Preservation and does a ton of Texas history work. He's so dedicated he actually bought and lives in a very historic property in Galveston County. In 2015, Sam was named Galveston City, or excuse me, Galveston County Citizen of the Year by the uh, Galveston Daily News and in 2012 was recognized as an unsung hero by that same newspaper. Sam is extremely dedicated to Texas history in Galveston history, and uh, he started this project, this Absolute Equality Mural. And so I thought it would be a nice bonus to talk to Sam about the project, how it came about, and what his vision is for this wonderful asset that he has given the city of Galveston. So enjoy this interview with Sam Collins III. Well, good morning, Sam. Thanks so much for being on Wise About Texas this morning. How are things? Oh, it's great. Thanks for the invitation. Well, you are uh, a pioneer of sorts when it comes to Juneteenth history, and I'm so grateful that you agreed to come on. Uh, The listeners of this bonus episode will have heard, hopefully, an interview with Ed Cottom about the sort of the scholarly history of Juneteenth, how it came about and all of that. But now today, I want to talk with you about what it means, because you've designated a significant part of your life and your activity toward uh, a remarkable project in Galveston, Texas, that we're going to talk about. Um, But first, I want you to tell the audience how you got involved in history and why you study history. Well, uh, I guess it started in college uh, when I read the autobiography of Malcolm X and and then uh, got involved with the Griot Society, which is an oral storytelling and then uh, just kind of got bit by the preservation bug in 2005 when I bought a historic property in Hitchcock, Texas, a home built for um, Confederate soldier Henry Martin Stringfellow. I began restoring it. And the first Juneteenth celebration we had there was on June 17th, 2006. And the reason I mentioned that date is because it became a national holiday on June 17th. 2021. So I thought that was amazing. So uh, yes. uh, yeah, I got involved then and, and started uh, working with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. I was nominated to be an advisor by Betty Massey and Marsh Davis, who were very active in Galveston with the Galveston Historical Foundation. And I've been on the National Trust for Historic Preservation uh, Board of Advisors since 2007. So that was uh, my introduction, and it's been 14 years of of growth of trying to help America tell this uh, full story. Well, and you've done a remarkable amount of work in a short amount of time. Um, Now, the mural, and I'm going to tell the audience, we we released the Juneteenth episode on Juneteenth 2021, the first Juneteenth, after it was made a national holiday. Um, And on that date... uh, we dedicated a mural in Galveston, Texas, entitled Absolute Equality, which is uh, a phrase from General Order Number 3 um, issued, uh, which is responsible for the date of Juneteenth. And the mural is remarkable. It's 5,000 square feet. It's on the side of a building. How did this project begin, Sam? Well, uh, last uh, summer, I read a a guest column written by Sheridan Lorenz in the Galveston County Daily News. I reached out to her and we have been talking about some other projects and things in Galveston. 
And then uh, I mentioned to her that the, the side of the old Galveston Square building was blank and it's owned by Mitchell Historic Properties. And it was uh, close to the location or next door, really, to where the Osterman building stood, which was the union headquarters in 1865. Uh, it has since been torn down and, and is a parking lot. But when it was torn down, that exposed this wall and it's been blank for years. And I thought it would be great to expand the narrative to tell a more complete story of what happened when uh, Granger came into Galveston, not only by itself, but with thousands of soldiers, many of them being United States colored troops. Well, that's a great idea. How? Uh, where did you start? Did you start with the property owner? Did you start with the artist? Yeah. Well, first I had to get with the property owner to get permission to paint on their building, which uh, they were willing to do. Miss Lorenz is a Mitchell descendant. So when she talked to them, it was much easier for her to ask than me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so they were they were they were willing to do it. And then um, we had to get a design together. Young artist Chase Sampe did the initial design, which I shared with the uh, artist Reginald Adams. He uh, expanded the narrative and uh was more inclusive with some other things uh in the in the uh, mural and then uh we got it approved by the Galveston Landmark Commission uh cuz they had to approve the design and then we started fundraising and did a kickoff in February uh we had an initial goal of 400,000 and we raised 486,000 so far with another 20,000 of pledges that are coming in within the next week so we'll be over half a million dollars, 20 percent above our our goal, which is not bad. And oh, no, that's incredible. <laughs> so Reginald Adams was the main artist on this project, but he couldn't do this. One. What, tell us yeah. how the how the actual artwork was created. Yeah, he is the lead artist. He has a team of artists he calls the creatives, uh, which is made up of Kadavian ba Baylor, Dantrell Boone. Uh, Samson added New Bay, Cherry Meekins, and Joshua Bennett. Uh, they designed it together. And then amazingly, uh, one night they went out there with a projector, uh, projected it against the wall and sketched it out. I mean, watching them on those, uh, uh, man lifts, get it, get the sketch completed was just incredible. So, you know, that, that keeps it to scale based on the, the design. And then they came back and kind of paint by numbers. Uh, you know, they, uh, it's, it's a, a, a great process. They, they, they have a, um, a team that works well together. They started March 9th, I believe, and they finished April 13th. So a little over a month and they were complete and, and the weather cooperated. Yeah. Thank goodness we had a good spring. Maybe that wasn't by accident. Well, you've got another unique aspect to this mural well, well give us sort of the physical dimensions i said it was five thousand square feet but tell us how tall it is how wide it is yeah it's so roughly 126 feet long and 38 feet tall so 125 feet by 40 feet would be exactly five thousand but it's uh, uh 126 by 38 so it's right under five thousand square feet but when you get to 4,700 or 4,800, you just round up to five. You're right. It doesn't matter at that point. <laughs> at that yeah, point, yeah, it yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah, um, yeah. You're closer to five than four at that point. <laughs> That's for sure. So uh, you've also got a very unique aspect to this work, and that is an app that can help people learn more about it when they visit. Tell us about that. Yeah, there is a uh, uh, app called Uncover Everything. A young man, Danny Asbury L., is the president of a nonprofit, Soil International. They were the first to bring augmented reality to Houston uh, on murals, and now they are the first to bring them into Galveston. In addition to the uh, mural being able to use this app, you can uh, do a freedom walk from the uh, Seaport Museum where the Middle Passage marker starts, uh, come to the Juneteenth marker and mural, uh, over to the old custom house, uh, Reedy Chapel in Ashton Villa is five stops on this freedom walk. And this, this freedom walk, um, the Galveston Convention and Visitors Bureau created it. If you complete it, you can get a poster 
uh, that they're giving away free kind of win a prize for doing this freedom walk for these five stops. But this app, when you point your smartphone at the mural and hit the scan button, it will pop up a video that will expand and teach you more of the history. So these videos can be any length. So any organization that has historical markers, I would encourage you to contact this young man and, and think about doing it because uh, it engages the youth. Uh, of course, adults can can use it too, but it really engages the youth uh, with the technology. Uh, you just see the kids light up when they point their phone. I've watched them point their phone and go, oh, that's so cool. You know, so, <laughs> so that, that's the next next generation. And it often seems, and, and certainly I've learned with the podcast, if you can get the history to them without them knowing they're getting it, uh, you can have tremendous impact, uh, which is so, Absolutely. so important these days, more important than it's ever been. Well, tell us what uh, you you hope that this mural adds to, to Galveston. It's such a historic place in Texas. What what's your What's your hope for this mural and the people that see it? Well, many people have had Juneteenth celebrations out of state. Uh, there, there are places that have much larger Juneteenth celebrations than Galveston just because of the sheer population in their cities. But there should be no place that has a more significant Juneteenth story because we actually have the, the land in that southwest corner where this historic event occurred. Nobody can duplicate that. You you could try to rebuild the building, uh, but you can't have the exact location of the union headquarters. So we have something unique as a certified tourism ambassador here in Galveston. Uh, it's my hope to increase tourism to the island, but not only the tours, but for the locals to learn this history, which this corner is now an outdoor classroom. And I think it's so important that we uh, use these assets in our community uh, to benefit the locals and to the tourists as they come in. Uh, so we can teach this history in many ways. Individuals can uh, appreciate the art. Uh, they can uh, uh, use the technology. They can read and research. Uh, you know, there, there is already uh, emails and messages coming in with, with, with different points of views of the, of the mirror and project. And that gets people to talking and discussing it. So we need to, you know, uh, uh, have those debates and conversations uh, to not necessarily even debates, just have the conversation to be more open about telling a fuller history of our American story. I often use the analogy of a green salad, lettuce and tomatoes are the stories you hear all the time about founding fathers, early settlers, but there are so many other people that were part of that story. So you have sliced onions, bell peppers, crouton, pickles, bacon bits, <laughs> And it just flavors <laughs> up the history. And if we could flavor up the history, we could get more people involved. Uh, I, I never read about these soldiers, the United States Colored Troops, in any history books that uh, I read in elementary, junior high, high school or, or college about the fact that they walked the streets of Galveston and would, was there to enforce law and order. So I think we don't need Hollywood to, to create make-believe heroes. We have real heroes in our history in our families and we need to tell the real stories of what happened. It's not a attack on anyone or, or trying to uh, change the, uh, their heritage. It's just telling the history as it happened. We went to primary source documents, newspaper reports, military records, and found this information that hasn't been shared with individuals. Well, I couldn't agree more. We need, we need more real historical scholarship and less uh, advocacy masquerading as history because we don't need to fight about it. We need to learn it. And uh, the stories are so rich, especially in Texas, of course, um, and especially in Galveston. OK, you mentioned the United States Colored Troops. troops so I'm going to ask you a story uh, that you're not prepared for. But tell us about William Costley. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> I know you I, like I, this story. I wake up ready. So uh, <laughs> just, just, just <laughs> throw them in. If, if, if I strike, I get three strikes. So uh, you can get me with one, but but I'm about to knock this one right out the park. Uh, Tell us William about it. Cost, 
Yeah, William Cosley. So many people associate Abraham Lincoln with the Emancipation Proclamation and uh, the story of him uh, freeing the enslaved people in southern states, which he did not free enslaved people in Union territories. But Lincoln's first uh, work to free an enslaved person was a woman named Nance Leggins Cosley in 1841. She had an infant son named William Cosley at that time. Costly ends up growing up, joining the Union Army, part of the 29th Regiment of Illinois, and he was in Galveston in June of 1865. So here, again, is a real story that many people have never, ever heard until I met Carl Adams, who wrote the book about Nance Leggins Costly. I had no idea of this story about Lincoln. Never heard it, not once anywhere of him working on this case to help help Nance win her freedom, which then helped her children to become free. And the story of William Cosley being the first male uh, freed by Abraham Lincoln, becoming a Union soldier, and then being in Galveston to to help deliver the message of freedom is one that I think uh, Hollywood really needs to produce. And maybe I'll get this documentary done before Carl does it. Carl has to do it. He actually wrote the first story (laughs) on Nance. Well, that's truly amazing. And Lincoln was a lawyer at the time, wasn't president, freed, freed William Costley's mother in court. And then William Costley shows up uh, on Juneteenth, 1865. Mm-hmm. That's incredible. Well, what's uh, this is a great project and a great accomplishment. But uh, I know that you don't sit around. So what's next? Yeah, in Galveston, uh, they have, uh, you know, people have been debating the Confederate monument, and I was invited to speak at a uh, county commissioner's meeting, and I I, uh, suggested that they do not take it down to everyone's surprise. And uh, they thought they had invited me to argue about taking it down, so those that were in support of taking it down was kind of shocked. But again, I told them, you know, uh, that's what's so great about America and being independent and free. You can have your own opinion and people don't have to agree with you. But the reason I I argue not to take it down is that I suggested that we put four new monuments up, one of them being of William Costley, another one of a young man named Jordan Morris, who died on June 20th in Galveston in 1865. So he made it to Galveston. Uh, but then he died. And then, uh, that was a sailor, Jack Hilliard, I, I believe is the name. And, uh, and, uh, often forgot about, uh, individual in the story is Major Frederick Emery, who actually wrote General Order Number Three and signed it under the command of Granger. And I know Ed loves Emery. So I don't have to give y'all the history of that. If they've no, already right. talked to Ed, he's already slammed Granger and lifted Emery <laughs> way up. So I, I, I completely uh, uh, want to uh, s- uh, second his emotion that Emory needs to be recognized. And if we put those four statues there, it does a couple of things. One, it tells a more complete story with including Major Frederick Emory, but it also tells the story of these other three uh, United States colored troops, uh, black soldiers and the sailor, uh, which gives a ratio of 75 to 25 percent which according to General Philip Sheridan, that's what the numbers were in January of 1866. He had 6,500 white Union soldiers and 19,768 black soldiers in Texas. So the kids come out, they learn a little math, they learn a little history, uh, they learn some military history, and we uh, put the all the statues in context with each other, and we create another outdoor classroom. So you go from first period at the absolute equality mural over the second period in front of the old courthouse square. So I'm going a, I'm to a try to see how many periods we could get together and, and have a complete day. And if you do the uh, freedom walk, maybe that's, that's, that's PE. That's third. Period. That's right. So we're, <laughs> so we're going to get them moving to uh, get them exercising because the kids need to get away from the Xbox and, and being inside. I have a 12 year old, like many others have children and grandchildren. School is just not fun to them. They're not interested, but hopefully what we're doing will get them interested. And and with the art installation, maybe there's an opportunity to have a a rotating exhibit uh, at that spot where we can change it up and keep keep it fresh and new with a new interpretation of the Juneteenth story every, every so often, three to five years or so. We don't know yet. It would all depend on funding and all, all depends on 
find an additional artist that could do that work and, and tell the story. Uh, but it would create a buzz about that corner that, uh, if you like what's up there, you need to really come and visit it because it's going to be that temporarily. And if you don't like what's up there, you can just wait a few years and it's going to be moved anyway. So, uh, you know, monuments have a way, uh, uh, over time, uh, opinions change as we see now. So maybe we've created a new model that will allow for, uh, future interpretation of the story at that location by, uh, current artists of that time period. Well, that's a remarkable project, Sam. You, you've got the right spirit. You know, more history is better than less. And, and history is not uh, about exclusion. It's about uncovering things and including them to make your story fuller. And, uh, you know, that's been that's our history. Um, and it hadn't happened as fast or as perfectly as everybody wants it to. But that's human nature. So thank you for all your work. Um, how can the listeners get in touch with you uh, on social media and follow what you're doing? Yeah, they have, uh, the Juneteenth Legacy Project has a website, JuneteenthLegacyProject.com. Uh, we also have a Facebook page and Twitter account. Uh, I have an, a personal Instagram account, uh, Sam3, the number three, Pics, P-I-C-S. So just S-A-M-3, P-I-C-S. I'm also on, uh, Facebook as Sam Collins. Uh, I'm Sam Collins the third. My dad is a junior, so you, you might go, Pick the wrong Samuel Collins, but if you send him a <laughs> if you send him a message, he will forward it to me. I get them all the time. Okay. Uh, so. Well, great. Well, Sam, thank you so much for all your work for Texas. Thank you for your friendship, and uh, thank you for being on Wise About Texas today. I really appreciate it. All right, thank you for the invitation. Well, that wraps it up for this bonus episode of Wise About Texas. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, that was a great interview, and remember, we need more history not less. And just because uh, one history story gets told doesn't mean another needs to get taken away. So I hope uh, you will go out and do something for Texas today. And until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.